greatest introduced, the wonderful, the incredible, the international superstar, the person who has drawn the biggest crowd in the history of creative conversation. Ladies and gentlemen, put your hands together for Juliet Robertson. Good afternoon everyone and thank you so much for taking time out of your busy lives to come here. Um, I don't know about you but whenever I went to a twilight training or CPD or something, getting there was the achievement, wasn't it? <laughs> Anything else is really a bonus. Um, I'll try and move along through this fairly quickly, but not least because, you know, it's probably wine o'clock already for most of us. Um, in terms of the con... The, the creative conversation. What I'm really planning to do is to just sort of, I'd love to tell you there's a nice order and structure to this and that it's been beautifully planned. And it's a bit sort of mishmash of different things because I'm aware it's going to be a mishmash of an audience. So, um, humor me. That's it, sorry. I know, funny. That's it, done. All right, so just, just to sort of hop right the way back. My outdoor things really began when I ran away to Stirling University aged 16 because um, I wasn't particularly happy growing up in air. I wanted to leave air, I wanted to leave my family, didn't want to worry them though. So off I went to Stirling and realised very quickly I didn't know very much. And I was doing an environmental science degree so I decided to have a gap year. Um, after second year and I promised myself to do lots of things to learn about children being outside and maybe th some of the things I wanted to do because I'd done something um, at university I'd, I'd started doing sciences chemistry, biology and environmental science and I looked at the art students <coughs> who had nine hours a week and no exams <laughs> and I looked at my 27 hour timetable with three exams and thought I've done something wrong here. So I, I asked around, what's the dossiest course you can do at this university? And everyone came back saying, it's education. You get a master's for turning up. And I was like, hallelujah, that's my course. I dropped chemistry, went into education and loved it. It was science, um, secondary science. And so I loved it so much, I went and asked if I could do a second course. And they hummed and hard because I was doing environmental science. And because I lacked the regional specialisation that geography offers, I was not eligible to teach geography, okay? And I wasn't <laughs> eligible to do biology because I missed one semester. So I begged and pleaded and got onto the course and I was so rubbish at the teaching that I was removed from the classes I was teaching, not the children. <laughs> so that gives you an idea. If, if anyone ever feels, oh my goodness me, it's been a bad day, I always say, well, there is hope. We can work at our practice. So in the, the, the set, in 1987, in that gap year, I was sent away to Philadelphia to do something that William Penn would approve of because my mother and my grandmother are Quaker and there was this bursary available for young Quakers to go and do something that William Penn would approve of. And I wrote to this nameless, this Billy, just oozed enthusiasm for outdoors and children. And she said, come and work over here at this centre. And this was where I worked. It's a Puerto Rican neighbourhood. At that time, the average age of crack addiction was 12 years old. When I was there for the summer, there were three shootouts. And I knew those people who were shot and killed. So it was a very dangerous, it was a very unhappy existence. But one of the things I learned about that was about being the change you want to see. Because to give you an idea, the, the centre where I worked looked out onto a green. And it was that the parks department said this green was too small to be an official park, so they were not going to maintain it. The waste department said they're not going to pick up the litter because that's a park's job. So in precisely 20 years, that, that park was cleaned once, and that was when the Vice President of America popped by. Okay? So we learned that if we wanted to do things, we had to do them. And it was a very good lesson for life. 
Um, and while I was there, I worked with a group of 11 to 14 year olds considered for neighborhood successes because they weren't on crack cocaine. It didn't matter that they couldn't read or write. Okay? The definition of success was to graduate from school. Again, it didn't matter if you could read or write or what your level of education was. So in terms of what I feel we can become, I know that we are a long way from that. And I think that should give us hope in spite of everything. And then in 1992, there we are, there's my class, first class. Isn't it strange to see ties? It's not often you see ties anymore, is it? And again, because I've done work with archaeology and being outside, I took children to the woods just in the summer term, um, as many weeks as I could, usually around about four to six weeks. I just said yes to everybody coming, you know, so I would say to parents uh, who would say to me, oh, but I've got a two-year-old, I said, great, come along, bring them to. And we would just all go to the woods to do what I would call Joseph Cornell and Steve Van Matra type activities, which were kind of the bog standard thing that you did outside at that particular time. And then I was lucky enough to go to Canada, where I went to a very, very forward-thinking um, outdoor education centre run by this guy here, Mark. Um, and it was really great. We took we, every child in this part of Toronto had an entitlement to a free residential in um, this particular residential centre um, in their grade 6P7 time. And um, to quote Tim Brickhouse, who said, you know, you know, I hate to put, paraphrase him, but he said he talked something about a, week's, a week in a residential is worth three months of education. And I think having seen 50, 40 weeks of children come through like that, I tend to agree with that because some of the letters we got back were phenomenal and the opportunities it gave children who didn't have opportunity and the idea was to give children experiences they couldn't get um, in, the, in their classroom or school. So one of the jobs was to look after the farm that was on site. They would collect the eggs, feed the pigs and things like that and they'd always be told on Thursday after the Wednesday night burgers that the burgers were last year's cow. Do you know what I mean? So it was, it was actually very real. Here, here's some children looking after the bees. The honey was always processed. It went off to shows um, one year, a few years before I arrived. It even won the sort of best in Ontario, the honey from the Sheldon bees. And again, this is a shelter <coughs> built by the pre P7 children who were visiting over the course of one week, that sort of thing. So things were done with children, things were co-created with children, and they had a full say in what they were going to be doing during that week. Furthermore, the teachers who went weren't allowed to sit back, and they didn't just hang around, they had to teach too. So in other words, they were responsible for part of the curriculum that happens there. And it could either be something that they would get support at to develop their own CPD, or it would be something that they were maybe comfortable doing and didn't need to do it. Like if they'd done orienteering every time they come, they might have wanted to continue with that. But all in all, it was really good. We did pre-visits, we did post-visits and things, so that we knew that there was a good connection with what was going on uh, in P7 in terms of embedding it into their other experiences. And that's just how I feel now. Do you know what I mean? That since then, it's just been some ride. Because when I was at Sheldon, the whole idea, as I said, was that there's stuff we want to give children an experience they can't have in school. And I kept thinking, I could do this in school, as we were sitting there doing watercolour painting outside. I could do this in school, <coughs> doing poetry trails and things like that. And I kept thinking, this could be really good if... 20 years on, that well, 23 years on, I've still got a list as long as my arm of potential and possibility of things I learned from there that haven't yet planted in terms of seeds to grow. Okay? And when I stopped being a head teacher, I'd love to tell you I had this blazing, glorious success as a head teacher. And in terms of inspections, yes, I was very good in terms of my leadership, but I was absolutely abysmal at looking after myself through the process. So I had to stop. There was no choice. At, at the age of 39, I was totally washed up as a stressed out head teacher. They wanted to retire me at the age of 38. The occupational therapist did not think I was fit for teaching which for somebody who all I'd ever wanted to be was to be a head teacher, this was absolutely soul-destroying. And I had to basically rethink, what am I going to do? And I thought I'd do law. 
Do you know what I mean? But then I went back onto the supply list and um, really discovered how much I loved it. And that's very conference. In 2007, I met people and outdoor learning was beginning to take off through the Curriculum for Excellence. And since then, we've had a number of documents. Would anyone like to hazard a guess at the number of documents we might have had in publication <laughs> supporting outdoor learning and play? Okay, I'll just go through them. So we've got... A, it's a bit of a random choice, but there's active learning in the early years. There's the one that David chaired, things like that, the taking the learning outdoors. I stuck in the early years framework because that's the first reference to forest kindergartens, nature kindergartens, that sort of thing as a medium-term priority. Out curriculum for excellence for outdoor learning, the practical guidance that supported that, the learning for sustainability work, going out there, revised national guidance, the base <coughs> strategy. We've got, I've, again, I've put in how good is our early learning and child care, or how good is our school, because of the number of references to outdoor learning and sustainability. We've got My World Outdoors, Vision 2030. We've got Liz Parks Play, Space to Grow. And just last week or the week before, Out Came, Out to Play. So for those people who think this is a fad, I think I, I would hope that people would look at the numbers in this room to say this is a real genuine interest in outdoor learning and play and we're seeing it now at the front line as well as nationally and that for those people who think it's just a fad, I think you need to think again. Okay, This is not going to change. This is not going to stop because we have climate change <coughs> happening. It's real. And if we don't do something now, here and now, how will our children cope when they're older? We can do our bit. Okay? And for me too, I'm just interested because I think outdoor learning and play, while it's great fun playing with sticks and things like that, actually I think there's a bigger agenda. And first of all, one of the reasons why I'm into the outdoors is because of the inclusive aspect. If I am a child, it doesn't matter what my ability is, it doesn't matter what my class is, what my background is, I can find a stick and use it in maths, yeah? Or I can find a stick and use it in my mode play, that sort of thing. I think it's really inclusive too because we know the benefits. <coughs> research document after research document types of benefits. You know, I think it's very interesting that we can do things outside that really encourage us to rethink our addiction to stuff and resources. Yeah? So again, we've got an opportunity to rethink. And I think this one is so important too. It's about the love and the care. All right? We don't often use those words enough in education, but that really matters. And naturally... We've got to think creatively. You know, the future's uncertain, and what we do know is that creative thinking is going to be an absolute necessity as part of that. And in many ways, that's not an old thing. We've always had to be creative. That's how we've got where we've got as a society, isn't it? Okay, <coughs> so I'm just going to move on. I'm not going to talk for too much long before I get you to sort of think and do things. But I'd just like you to imagine, so it's just been Christmas, and if like me, you're feeling a bit heavier than you'd like to be, that sort of thing. Some of you might have signed up to a gym, yeah? So I want to imagine you've just signed up to a gym, and you meet your trainer who says, Hi, come on into my gym, and let's give you press-ups. And he says, we'll start with two rounds of five press-ups, and then after a couple of days, we might get into two rounds of six, three rounds of six, and we'll, we'll move it on like that. And... If you do that really well, we'll give you pull-ups as well. At that point, you're probably looking around at all the gym equipment and you're going to go, I'm not going to get a shot on that, that gym equipment there. And the trainer says to you, no, that's not important. Pull-ups matter, press-ups matter, none of the rest of the stuff is that important. Yeah, we've got it, but it's just for show. You would probably walk out of that gym pretty quickly thinking, that's weird, Okay. I, I want the full experience. So I question an uh, education system that is very narrowly focused on literacy and numeracy, not even maths, but numeracy, part of maths, because I think that's like going to that sort of gym. An education system that's solely focused on attainment, again, is a very narrow, limited <coughs> form of education. So if you think of education like a gym, 
then we, we start thinking about, yeah, what do we actually need to grow up around it, to be fully fit as humans in every sense of the word. And I don't know if many of you have seen this before. This is the building blocks for learning from Turnaround USA. And this, this charity was set up after the 9-11 um, um, events so that um, to help children cope with the trauma of 9-11. They quickly found that the children, although upset by 9-11, were actually traumatised by the poverty and the conditions in which they were living in the poorest parts of New York. It wasn't uh, and that really that's what support was needed. <coughs> and if you look here, we've got a whole heap of building blocks that come in. And some of them we recognise. But what I like about this is the uh, recognition that it's all of these that matter. It's not just attachment, it's not just resilience, it's the whole whack, okay? My mm -hmm. other interest in this is that when I take any of these building blocks, I see a relevance to being outside. So that's why I'm really interested, because I think when we go through education, at the back of my head, I might be doing... Do you know what I mean? A lesson on mini beasts, but at the back of my head, I need to, as a teacher, be making sure how am I attending to all of this? What support am I giving my children to help them grow up um, and, and be good, capable, broad citizens? So, I'm just going to flick quickly and say, on the basis of that sort of building blocks there, I've jumped to this picture and it's two. <coughs> It's two preschool situations. So here we've got a great preschool. It's gone natural. You can see that inside. Beautifully set up. And then we have this space where there's children playing outside. Okay? I would just like you to talk about what the differences are between these and, and why would it matter that the children get the wild space? Okay? What is it about the wild space, that, that indoor space, even though it's a really great school, really good nursery, why doesn't it just crack it in terms of that holistic well-being <coughs> and also any other aspect of education? Just have a chat. Why wild space matters? <coughs> There's more risk. Yeah. Okay, tell me more. Well, because there's water there, there's, there's rocks, they're, they're not, it's, not really, it's not really smooth. Uh, All right. The weather, see, it's just snow in there. Okay, so there's an element of unpredictability and the water, the un uneven rocks and things like that. Okay, thank you. Could somebody else, uh, maybe over this side, just give us a, another reason? <coughs> It's free, it's liberating, it's, it's not ordered, it's, it's a sense of excitement. Okay, it's free, it's liberating, there's a sense of excitement. All right, but why outside? It's too structured inside. I've been worried to touch something that I didn't do it in the right way. Okay. So that okay you adults. What is <coughs> what are left yeah. from the blood is manicured by adults mm -hmm. for young people and children to get involved with? Whereas one of them is like, it's not manicured, you know, it's for them to explore, it's for them to seek out. Yes. Things. So, and for them to understand the boundaries, the dangers for themselves. <coughs> yes. Well, well, I think that both of those touch on, on very core things. In fact, all of them do. Because when you look at this, as you say, some an adult has set this up. An adult has made very deliberate choices about where things go, what is presented and why. So if, if we're thinking about um, Simon Nicholson and his theory of loose hearts and how not to teach cheat children then actually that's just what we've done here. The adults have had all the fun here setting this up. Do you know what I mean? Here, there is no setup. Ah, lazy teacher is great, isn't it? You know, no setup needed. But also, because of that, straight away, inside there is an unsaid, I feel, 
um, in uh, uneven distribution of power, which when you go outside, it goes back to that social and inclusive ethos of there isn't, nobody set up that space. That's how it was. That's nature. So suddenly, a child has a sense of freedom when they realise that. And when you do things in, as a child outside, you pick up something like a stick or a stone and you move it and you put it somewhere else. And as you do so, you can feel the water on your feet. You can feel that roughness of some of the pebbles or the smoothness of the rock. You are getting a connection in a way that you wouldn't normally get inside in an artificial <coughs> environment. And you are beginning to shape that environment and change it and make it. So when we talk about <coughs> autonomy, that's, that is a very autonomous environment for children. And therefore, permissions and things matter too. So it goes back to just even that tiny little thing there. You can see the agency that happens. We can see that there's curiosity happening, self-direction. All these things start to come into place. And then it's sort of like the building blocks are building themselves. And we don't have to work so hard to make that happen. Okay? Um, and again, I always say it's different outside. Some people get very upset about the idea of doing something that, you know, that's an indoor activity or an outdoor activity. And I don't worry about that because I know outside, even something like hula hooping, if I was hula hooping here, it would be a very different experience if I was hula hooping as a street artist or I was hula hooping on a grassy bank and things like that, feeling the grass beneath the, my feet, the interplay of the wind as it grabs my hula hoop, particularly in a windy place like Edinburgh. Do you know what I mean? It all, all adds up to something a bit different. Okay? And even in terms of things like performances, I don't know if any of you were lucky enough to see the Scottish Bally. It was done in conjunction with the Forestry yeah. Commission, wasn't yeah. it? Um, and it was called Hansel, Gretel and Me. And they went around three... Was it three or four different forests yeah. engaging with local communities <coughs> to create performances? And it's the first time I've ever seen ballet dancers in wellies. Fantastic. And I just felt that that in itself was very liberating, doing something that is normally traditionally done inside, but they had to adapt to being outside. And adapt they did. And it was the most memorable um, performance I think I've ever seen. And I just feel, I know sometimes that this can be paraphrased in different ways, but there is something about that fact that when you are in touch with the ground, when you are either walking or feeling and things like that, that actually there's, there's deeper things going on. Okay? So for me, when it comes to looking at the outside too, what I also find is that this whole idea of needing stuff, needing resources kind of disappears because there's loads of stuff outside. For those of you who work in concrete jungles, I do appreciate that's different. You do have to import stuff. But even so, the only environment i found that's been truly tough to find things in has actually been astroturf. Do you know what I mean? That's, that's the real killer for me. You know, that's where importing becomes more... Um, and I just want to sort of have a think too about loose parts and what we actually mean by this. Because very often I'm told these, you know, people see it's all about the tyres and the bread crates and things like that. Some people talk about natural materials. Other people recognise the random found objects. But if we look at what Simon Nicholson says, he goes a bit deeper because he talks about phenomena and variables, and I love the fact that that includes wordplay, sounds, music, fluids, motion. So in other words, we're not just talking about this stuff here, it goes back to this interplay, this interplay that outside you get loads of, the interplay with gravity, the interplay with the wind. You just think about it, if you try and den build outside, my goodness me, you're going to have to problem solve without thinking of it most days, because the wind will create something or the the trees aren't the right distance apart or, you know, the lamppost's a bit wobbly and should you use it? So there's constant problem solving happening. What do you think about this? Does this make sense to you? And has anyone got any questions or points at this moment in time? Is it a reasonable thing to sort of say? Because one of the things, again, 
that does interest me is that if you do a, a sort of look on on the internet these days for loose parts, a lot of it's becoming more and more sanitised. We're seeing beautiful displays inside of corks and buttons and things like that, what I call tabletop loose parts. But to me, if, you, if you're missing the phenomena and variables, I, I would question, are you doing what Simon Nicholson and his theory of loose parts had and, did, and are you doing justice to that? Okay. And just moving on to that, common sense says that with the interplay comes the interplay with the landscape. So you kind of can't think about loose parts and what you have outside without thinking about the landscape and topography and that works. So I love this here. This is a, a wee photo from Iceland. And the children are going off site to go um, to just enjoy a session in um, near an Icelandic wood. But we, we have to be careful when we use the term forest because there is a, there's a wee joke in Iceland and it says, what happens if you get lost in an Icelandic forest? Does anyone know? You do, you're right, you just stand up. Do you know what I mean? It's so small. So it is, but it kind of, when you're three, it still looks nice and foresty. But when they come out, they always come out and you can see the adults walk along here, but some of the children have to walk along the boundary there. Because the children don't see that as a barrier. They see that as a place to climb. And I've got another one here. Have we got anyone here from Jupiter Artland? Yay! <laughs> All right, what a fabulous, fabulous resource to have on the doorstep. And one of the things I love when you come in are those mounds. All right, but also what fascinates me is how children perceive those mounds. Because we know that the spirals are meant to walk along the spirals up and up and up. But for a lot of children, what do they want to do? They just want to run up and down them, roll down them. Half of them have the parents sort of saying, remember, not to step in the pond. And the children are going, oh, but I'd like to. Really, I'd like to. So again, what we have a perception of and what Charles Jenks perceived these to be is very different to how a child perceives it. And why does that matter? Because actually... That's about possibility. If you have an area that's high in affordance, high in possibility, then actually it encourages children to think things like, what if, how about, why not, I can. So here we've got a great example. This is also from Iceland. And as we went into that wee forest, you can, there was all this old agricultural machinery lying around. And of course, as adults, we see that as old agricultural machinery. And as you can see to the children, they saw it as um, playground equipment to play on. And what really happened was you could see some children went on there straight away. Some hung back. And you could see them really thinking through, could I do this? Shall I do this? And then having a go and further exploring the equipment. And again... We can apply that then to our outdoor space. So let's think about this in a curriculum way, just for the moment. We've got a lovely setup here um, with um, picnic tables and things like that and some nice boards like that. And over here we have this setup here. I want you to talk about the literary, literacy, <coughs> potential and possibility of each place. Okay? What's the potential in terms of literacy? the left hand one has more potential because you can imagine the kids um, making models in the sand and making up stories. Okay, for those of you at the back, this one, because of the sand, you've got the potential for model making and making up stories. Okay, could we have an idea from the back too, please? Form from the tree stumps. Uh huh. Okay, so they're sort of like miniature performance areas, aren't they? And yes, plays are essential for, for literacy, aren't they? Little micro-performances, brilliant. Anything else? What about a middle sort of idea? You could write in the sand. 
Okay, great. So it's, it's also a mark making area too. And by mark making, I know that sounds like an earlier term, but if you think about it, you can tell a story or a narrative, can't you, by writing or making marks in the sandpit? Yes. All right, so again, focusing on the sand and saying that is with a frame around it, you've got a picture making possibility. Is that correct? Out, out of the sticks, make your own frame and children can do individual ones out with the sand. Okay, got you. Yes, thank you. Did you all hear that? All right, brilliant. Yes? I'm not sure if you've done it deliberately, but um, the one on the right, we were saying that actually you could stand on the table and perform, or you could, you know, you could create your own place to live or um, you know, a house or a, a castle or a den. But notice you've got the pebbles at the bottom there that you could actually be using to make into shapes or, or letters. But you could make basically you're making your own stories, that kind of thing, words and whatever. Okay, so again just the pebbles here, but there's the possibility of standing on the bench, turning this into a den, things like that. Okay? So what I think here is that I never go outside and say, oh, that's rubbish. Do you know what I mean? I always say, what you've got is what you've got. Make the most of it. And just like Sal has said here, do you know what? this could become a den. This could become something else. Personally, between the two of them, I love this too just for the, the scope of the stumps. Because again, in terms of literacy, I like the idea of going first and you tell one part of the story, second, you go on to the next, so third, so you can do sequencing. I love the fact that this sandpit, and I just think personally that all raised beds, all sandpits that are raised, anything, if you ever have a choice, go for something with as wide a boundary as possible so that you can sit on it, or children can jump off it, or you can stomp a toy dinosaur along it to tell a story, that sort of thing. And again, as, as people alluded to here, anything where you can manipulate just, uh, again, lifts the possibilities. But, I mean, you just take what you've got. Okay. And again, something that sometimes people forget is that when you're outside... A good way of evaluating places can often be through the actual visual elements. You know, aesthetically, does this place have line? Does it have shapes that would engage? What <coughs> sort of forms are there for children? Patterns and textures. Very often we forget that you can look at things aesthetically, you can look at things physically, and things like that too. But my top tip is this from Australia. And it was, um, I, I've, I, I'd often talked about a lovely school grounds activity where you hang cards with a little heart on, with a big heart, and on a luggage tag, which has a big heart, and you say what you love. This is my favourite place over here. I love it because I can play football. And then you take another luggage tag with a little heart and you put it to the place that needs a little bit more love. But in Australia, I actually saw an owner of a nursery walk around her space and go, that needs a bit more love over here. Oh, this place feels loved here. And I thought, what a brilliant way of evaluating any space in, inside or out. Does it feel loved? Does it feel careful? Does it need a bit more love? Does it need a bit more care? Any child of any age can contribute. Any parent can contribute. Any staff can contribute. Absolutely brilliant. And I wanted to flag up this particular one because this is in a very... This is in Northfield in Aberdeen. And the nursery nurse, the earliest practitioner, and the deputy head who did this, it wasn't an overnight job. This is three years into the making, but it's all being done by begging, borrowing, of course not stealing, but just using stuff that they can find or source from donations. And it was a blank concrete space. It's in an area where, yes, it should be vandalised, but because everybody loves it, they found that it still does get vandalised, but not like what they expected. And they just in plan for that eventuality so that they know on Friday nights they'll take the pots inside. Over the, over the holidays, they'll clear out things that they think may get removed and, and removed permanently and not just removed and moved to a different part of the space. 
So I thought that was lovely. Um, and I'm also going to flag up here just um, Tom Bedard. Now, Tom Bedard does a brilliant blog called Sand and Water Tables. If you haven't seen it, I strongly advise you to go and have a look. It will totally redefine what you ever thought was possible at a sand tray or a water tray. And this is Fort William Stramash. And this is their sand pit area. Now, Cameron, the team leader there, he totally buys into the Tom Bedard design elements. And Tom's really straightforward. He just says, when you look at a space, now it can be as small as a water table, or it can be as big as a, as a whole zone or area. Think of it in terms of these things. Think about the levels. So in other words, if I take a water tray outside, that's okay, but it's a pretty dismal experience compared to the possibilities that exist. So maybe beside my water tray, could I put something on the ground, like a tyre with a tarp inside it to create a splash pool? Could I actually have something like some water, a water canister hanging up, so every time the children need the water, can they go and stretch to get some, and then they have to transport and carry it? Can I have an incline, incline somewhere, a slope? That might be a bit of guttering, but it even could just be a tarp that, again, is used for children to run water down. Could I have things that children can transport and use? And another top tip here for anyone who works in nurseries is that if you have children transporting and you can see medma, everything just going haywire, you provide a big dustbin or a big truck or something and just direct children, oh, can you just put it over there? That would be brilliant. And the children will do that. And again, it can really help in terms of management. And the other thing Tom is really into is the creating of spaces, holes, partitions and flaps. Okay? And that is absolutely key for so many things. So if I look at stuff, so I've just developed a water wall, I haven't blogged about it yet, from a piece of tarp, it's a portable one. So you have this little bit of tarp, and I've, I've put holes in it using um, ringlets, it's absolutely brilliant. And children can put those ringlets in themselves, it's so easy, they can hammer them in, decide where they're going, then you put ball bungees through them, and then you can hang pipes, you can hang guttering, you can hang anything you want, you can thread ribbons through, it doesn't really matter. But you can literally just pin it up to any wall, and off you go. You can pin it between two spaces, and you can work either side. But that's what the additions of holes to a tarp does. Okay, so that's all thanks to Tom Bedard. All right, and I apply this even to things like um, white sheets. So I'm going to have white sheets for people to work with shortly. Um, I don't know how clear this is, so I'll maybe, if I hold it up like, ooh, can you see it if I hold it like that? Is that clear? So do you see how I've partitioned it? Okay, I'm going to show you why shortly. That, is it, that lifts the learning. So I've got a white sheet and I've added partitions. Likewise, often with a TENS frame, here's, here's an example of partitions too. So a lot of people know about a TENS frame. I'll, I'll put this up here in case it helps too. Do you see how it's got the 10 squares on it? Okay, so if I am doing a game with children and they put one cone in each one, they can very quickly learn what's missing. So for things like number bonds within 10, it's very easy. Okay, But if I wanted a progression, all I need to do is to change the partitions. So here's the dice frame. Okay, Suddenly, if I hold it there, it's still 10s, but I've changed it. So we've got that little bit of twist. And again, if I wanted to change that even further... I could then add in a second tense frame or I could turn it over so that you no longer see the partitions and again we've lifted the learning and the challenge that little bit more because there's no gaps then to give children a visual clue. So I take this idea of the elements and just absolutely just tweak it and, and, and change it in lots of different ways. Does that make sense? Okay, and again, you can do that even in a concrete jungle. So this is um, this is a, a fairly standard playground frame in a nursery. It was a brilliant hot afternoon. I just happened to have a whole heap of stuff in, and I just said to the staff and children, let's just go for it. Let's set it up over 10 minutes, 
And again, we just did things like we added bubble wrap to the slide. We put the water um, canister at the top so that, again, the water would poke out. One of the children had the bright idea of adding colour to the water so that all the bubble popping, when it happened, all those pops filled back up with coloured water. When you press them again, little fountains came out, that sort of thing. So this setup was there, sort of over to one side where I was, there was a mini water train, a mini setup. And what we found was that that engaged those children for a whole afternoon. They were just playing and playing and playing very deeply, just experiencing water around climbing frame. So always, again, that whole principle of can I apply the elements and in what way. Another week, you could change this. It could become a musical playground. Another week, it could become a building playground. Another time, it could become, it could become whatever you and the children want, if you think in terms of elements, yeah? All right, and we're going to apply that thinking too <coughs> to other bits and pieces too. So what I've got here, and this goes back to the idea of, of, of you know, if we're not in a, a woodland where there's lots of diversity of sticks, stones and cones, how do we cope? So here we've just got an example of some pegs. I would like you to have a discussion and just have a wee think about why is it that I would be encouraging settings to have lots of different pegs rather than just to go out and buy a set of clothes pegs that are all the same? Why would I <coughs> say to people, bring in your old pegs rather than just saying, right, we're going natural, let's chuck them out and let's just have some wooden pegs? Why would I want this in terms of lifting children's learning? Do you want to just have a quick chat? <laughs> Let's just flip on some of the ideas here. Just give us an idea about why this might be good to have a random collection of clothes pegs. Different colours, different ways of sorting, different strengths of spring. Okay. Uh, from the same packet, it's not quite so interesting. Alright, so different colours, different ways of sorting, different spring strengths. Anything else people noticed? Yes, to help with classification. Now they're all different, but they're all pegs that you can apply to anything else. Absolutely. You just that they're all pegs, you know. Yes. We've got them all together as pegs, but they're all around the room or whatever. That's it. So did you hear that at the back about um, they're, all, they're all different, <coughs> but there's still a collection of pegs, so we've got very good classification going on here. Okay. Any other sort of ideas around this? You could imagine it's a play, like the creatures and different types of creatures and different attributes. That's it, because again, they can be. There's ones that you know; those always come and end up looking more like fish than they do crocodiles. Some definitely look more crocodile. And the pegs that are all the same, like this one here, because I've gone natural, you know, as part of my, because I've been told it's a good thing. Then suddenly I've missed out on a whole heap of diversity of of language for description of decision making when I look at those pegs as a child which one am I going to use which ones can I use which ones have I got the strength to manipulate which ones I don't that sort of thing do I like springs or am I a bit scared of the springs so will I go for one that's springless um, you can think too that they all have slightly different properties so again for that sorting and that attribute making we're lifting the mathematical work and we're lifting the literacy and we're even going into science so as a lazy teacher by having abundance and diversity like this I can actually do a lot within my environment to lift the learning that's just pegs let's imagine then you take it to things like lines for den building Okay. Do you want thick lines, thin lines? Do you want lines you can cut up, lines that are easy to tie, lines that are velcro? Do you want bandages that stretch? Do you want static lines? Do you want dynamic lines? Once we start thinking about diversity, we start lifting the learning. 
We can do it just even sticking on den building with things like the materials. You know, do we want big pieces, little pieces? Do we want pieces that float? Do we want pieces that are waterproof? Do we want pieces that actually feel soft and warm? Do we want ones that feel quite a different in texture? Do we want stuff that we can see through, stuff that we can't? And suddenly we are lifting the learning and we are, the environment is beginning to work for us. So even in a man-made jungle, we can do an awful lot. Does that make sense? Um, so hopefully that, that's just something to take away. And this works at all ages, not just for the early years. Okay. All right. Now, I've got a nice little problem solver for you. So you can see here, remember I showed you this actual sh sheet? So this is some work that a P4 child has done, or a group, I should say. I wonder if you can work out what's going on mathematically here. Okay, what is happening in this photo? Just see if you can have a, a work out. Feel free just to shout out. And, and this isn't a test, so we, we'll get there one way or another. <coughs> Is anyone prepared to shout out their ideas a bit more? Is anyone confident? So, one box is two, the other one is one, and then the other box is a, like a fifth of a tape. Say that again, a bit louder. So, like the top box is like a hole, so the hole is two, and then half of two is one, so that one there, and then boxes underneath that are. Uh, like other fractions within uh, as well. Okay, I, I love the way you're thinking, and 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 you, I, I'm sure a lot of people would be sort of on the the right lines too. So you're right. There is there is something going on. They worked the other way round. These in this one, they decided that um, the cones, these long cones here. Are, are tens and the gravel are units. So we've got 25 and 25 makes 50. Then they've substituted a long cone for a hundred and then doubled it there. And I think there was, I have very few big cones. So I think that's why those are all different, but they're still significantly bigger than this. So that was their reasoning. This came about. Very simply, we haven't been doing a lesson on place value. We'd been doing a lesson on um, how to partition on different ways of partitioning. And what I'll often do when I work with older children is we will do a quick game outside together. We'll share ideas. And then I'll often ask them to invent a game or invent a problem or a challenge and to talk about it to others. And that's one of the things that this group did. But I thought that was a really nice example of some good thinking by, um, by the primary fours. The other thing, the reason why I love using natural materials and also white sheets is that I'm going to demonstrate here... <coughs> If you've got a sheet like this, this white sheet, can you see how visually clear the cones are? They really stand out. So again, it helps children focus in. But if this sheet <coughs> is in the wrong place, you just move it. And for some reason, children don't see that as an error. They just see that as part of the process of working out the problem. So it's not like a whiteboard where you've got to rub out or a chalk that's indelible. So one of the things I always encourage classes to do is to try and cut back on chalk and to try and use more manipulatives instead because then the speed of the conversation is much quicker. And mathematically, children focus on the maths and not whether something is in the right place or not. It's only in the wrong place if it needs to work for the maths. And that sort of thing. So again, really think about this when you're outside, you know, can we cut back?